Good evening, everyone. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School uh, District 58 Board of Education here on Wednesday, October 14th, 2020 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Joshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchick. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. <coughs> Member Hughes. Here. Over the weekend, District 58 suffered the loss of one of its students, Hillcrest sixth grader Allison Manning. We are heartbroken for the Manning family, the Hillcrest family, and all of Allison's community. We would like to take a moment to observe a moment of silence in Allison's memory. Thank you. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket over on the table there to my right. Members of the public who are viewing remotely may provide a public comment by calling 630-743-4085 and recording their comment. Comments will be accepted until we reach the public comment portion of the agenda. We will play all comments submitted remotely in the order in which they were received. I have allotted 30 minutes for public comment tonight, up to three minutes each. Should there be time remaining, we will take any additional in-person comments. And as we always do, let's go ahead and start off the day with the flag salute, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, next up on the agenda tonight is our spotlight on our schools. We're going to welcome Todd Drayfall to talk about the tax levy. Good evening. Uh, Dr. Russell said I couldn't include the entire history of property taxes in Illinois. Um, so I, I, I cut it down to just a few slides. Um, <clears throat> going through this, and, and property taxes are our biggest uh, revenue source. Uh, to give a, a, a kind of a higher level overview of, of taxation in, in Illinois, uh, I went to the uh, Department of Revenue and the Comptroller's website 2019, uh, the last fiscal year that's posted for the state, uh, it would, state took in about $48 billion. 21 plus billion is in individual income taxes, 16 is in sales tax. 2018 taxes payable in 2019, so the same year, property taxes through the state of Illinois was $31.8 billion. 77% uh, of that uh, is within Cook and the Collar counties. Uh, in DuPage County, uh, well, it's about 9% of the state total or $2.9 billion. So, rightly or wrongly in the state of Illinois, um, that is how we fund uh, local government uh, and largely school districts uh, in the state. And um, so, it is one of our largest pieces of, of revenue. So looking at this year is at the 2021 budget, you can see, and we break it down by the uh, classification of property. This is from the budget uh, seminar uh, session a month ago. Um, about 80%, 83% of our total operational budget comes from property taxes. 66 of that is from residential, uh, and the remainder is, is non-residential. One of the big uh, positive things that um, Downers Grove District 58 has is it has a large commercial industrial structure uh, out from you know 88 Butterfield uh, as well as other areas throughout the, uh, the district that help uh, cover that that burden piece. Tax cycle is is there's two parts to it the assessment and valuation side uh, and and the levy and the request side. Um, the entire tax structure, the, the valuation system, exists solely just to collect taxes. The township assessor, supervisor assessments, the, the county 
a division of county clerk that, that manages that and, and the county treasurer, majority, uh, majority of their work in the treasurer's office is property tax collection. Uh, the township assessors on effective on the first of each year assess property. Uh, they do that, you know, they go through <coughs> the, the entire township, uh, place a value on it. Uh, the assessor then turns that over to the, the county, to the supervisor of assessments office. They uh, do a sales ratio study to determine if the assessments are comparative to the current sales. Uh, and every time a property is sold, uh, there is a document that's created and goes to the recorder's office. It goes into that valuation system, so that um, that that system is continually calculating what that will be. Um, it goes to a board of review. In those times, uh, property owners can you know talk to the assessor about their valuation of their property. They can then also go to the board of review and ask for. Um, Revaluation re or uh, file a complaint about the valuation. Uh, board of review uh, does a, a, an analysis. They certify uh, the valuations, and then they turn those over to the county clerk's office. The county clerk, in the meantime, uh, receives the levy request or the request from the, all of those units of government um, as to the mm -hmm. amount of money that they are asking for. Uh, that is. This is our introduction of that process. At the next board meeting, we will then uh, ask for an approval of a tax levy for the 2020 year uh, payable in 21, which is based on the assessments of the property as it is today. Uh, each unit of government adopts a levy, files that with the county clerk's office. The county clerk's office takes those valuation, the tax base, and uh, the, the levy requests from the units, puts those together and creates tax rates. Applies all the laws that come to, um, that are required. There are statutory limits for individual funds. So we, we levy an education fund, a operation and maintenance fund, a transportation fund, uh, IMRF and Social Security that are the, por the employer's portion um, of those, those costs and uh, some of those have limits, some of them don't, uh, and apply those against it. They also have what is the property tax extension limitation law, or the tax cap, PTEL or tax cap, um, and they apply that as well. County clerk calculates the rates, certifies the taxes to the treasurer, goes out to collection. Um, people receive their bills first half, do 30 days after receipt, um, usually in, um, let's go out in May and usually do the first week of June. Uh, second one is due uh, usually the same day in September, the same date in September. Unpaid bills go to a collection process where they go back to the treasurer, the treasurer then offers those up for sale and it's a sale that's sold by an interest rate. Um, that's what ensures the collection. That's why our collection is about 99.5, 99.6, percent of those taxes that are collected. Those that are not collected are usually due to bankruptcies or some other um, legal uh, structure that prohibits them being sold. Um, bankruptcy is most predominant piece that, that something happens uh, and at, at that point the property can't be uh, put up on a tax sale and be sold. I talked a little bit about the PTEL property tax extension limitation law or tax caps limits what each local unit of, let me back up, each non-home rule local unit of government uh, can, can access. Uh, it limits it by two things, by the consumer price index or that of inflation, um, and it gives allowance for new construction. It creates a ratio format where it's the total assessed value minus that new property. That's why those pieces are always very important uh, for the district because it's, it's what, um, when we talk about 80 some odd percent of our revenue each year, that's how that grows, is, is by that of inflation and then whatever new construction. We have been very fortunate, and we'll show that in a little bit with a, a chart, to have um, some very strong uh, new construction and new, um, new growth in the district over the last decade. Um, 
There's also another limit that has been placed on um, previous and the PTEL tax caps came into effect in 1992. Prior to that, units of government could go out for non-referendum debt for specific items and to certain things. Um, after that, they could not, and there was a period of time, and then a law was allow, um, allowed that there was a tax base created as an effective a date. And any unit of government that had a non-referendum debt structure could keep it at that level, and it grew by inflation each year. Some units of government had considerable amount of, of non-referendum debt. Um, Park districts do, you know, had some, if they were building a project and had used that for, and they had alternate, what they call alternate revenue bonds, so they pledged gate receipts on a, on a, on a pool system, you know, they put in a, a community pool, and they used what was going to be receipts to help pay for that project over time, and so they had, that debt was available. Uh, other places just happened to have working cash bonds, Health life safety bonds were part of that. So if you had, if a if a unit of government had or a school had borrowed for health life safety prior to that date, um, they were able to keep that, and it grew each year. Uh, Downers Grove uh, School District 58 was very conservative through its history and uh, did not have a, a strong debt structure. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, the district I was at previously had a annual, and it's an annual amount, not a total, but it's an annual what we can levy up to. Prior district I worked at had over five million dollars a year that it could borrow in that in that capacity. We have about a million and a half, so that is a limit uh, to uh, the district's capacity to do improvements and structures. We did a uh, Lester addition and, and some you know, the, the fire uh, system improvements and some other pieces. We've done, the district has done uh, most of the additions over the last decade have come out of that capacity. That too, again, grows by that inflation number. And as if you, we look at the CPI in a minute, um, you'll, you'll see that, you know, that that number hasn't gone up much uh, over a period of time. Um, the CPI in the last couple of years has been, un, you know, under two. There's a few, you know, the first year the tax caps came in, they were at 5%. Um, they were, you know, up and down. Uh, this tax levy that you will see uh, next month is based on a 2.3%. It's a higher percentage we've had in quite a while. Uh, it's most been, mostly been under, under the 2% piece. Um, Back in 2008, when we had that uh, the recession come in, it was a very strong year, and in one month, because the CPI that we use for both the uh, growth of that bond capacity and the property tax is the same number, uh, is the change from the previous December to the previous December. So you can have a very good, have a strong inflationary year and one or two months at the end of the year can change that. And that's what happened in 2008. It was hovering around two, three percent and it ended up at less than one, at 0.8 um, because obviously the economy from mid-November through December you know, shut down and, and, and had a de-inflation uh, de structure from the whole year and it, it lost all of that, <coughs> that growth and in inflation. Um, so this next year we have 2.3 percent um, and so that will be based on you know, we, we, we take that into account. The current year has been an interesting year because we've been very worried about that. We talked about that even back in April and May and, and through the summer as to what it might look like and you have two charts there. You have the historical one uh, going back some years, and you have the other one that is this year, um, and I give my kudos out to Mark Stalin at District 99. Each school business managers try to share information, and we all do little different pieces. 
Uh, Mark, every month, puts a chart and a whole um, structure together on, on the inflation uh, and CPI and sends it out to 20, 30 of us. So, um, so this is Mark's chart that he, uh, he has shared uh, each month. And you know, we were worried about it being, and at one point was trending almost to negative, and we were worried about that. Uh, it has since come up, and you can see that last month uh, that just was posted um, is at 1.3%, uh, which is a good number. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, um, now, it always does slide down in the you know, from November to December. Um, holiday sales, um, you know, things, you know, it does trend, usually tend to year after year go down a bit from that November to December uh, and, and a, little, a little lower. So we'll see how this goes the next couple months. As we always say, try to pay full price for things these days and not for discounts so that you keep the inflation up. Um, but <clears throat> this is, um, so this is what we're watching for. This is a, a big piece of our growth. Tax base, 2009, um, you can see that uh, the property tax base, or the, the, and this is estimated at one third of the fair cash market value of everything within the district was about $2.9 billion. Uh, you can see that over that period of time of, after that 2008 slide, uh, valuations decreased and then started to rise again, that we're back up to 2.95. Um, the big pieces that we look at is, is the new property. Um, and there's one chart I didn't add in here that we've added in the past and we can go back and, and we'll pull it together for the memo. And that is the amount of new construction of residential property over the last decade. Um, I think it has a market value of a half a billion dollars for the district uh, of just residential, and this is new construction. So it can be teardowns and then replacements, but it's new grow, you know, new building uh, that has happened uh, within the district, uh, which is a, a huge, huge piece. Um, we look at what the percentage is and, and the growth, um, and you can see each year, you know, over the last several years, it has continued to grow. The new property is an important piece. Um, the property tax limitation law is a ratio. So it's the tax extension or the, the taxes on top and the EAV property on the bottom, and it comes out to be a rate. And what we do is we take the base rate, which is the total EAV minus the new property. So the larger the amount that new property is, the rate goes up a bit, and that allows uh, for growth um, uh, for the district. 2020. Um, as I said, it's 2.3%. We won't know what the 2021 levy will be, but we do know that the 2021 levy in that new property number will be considerably higher because at the end of this December is when the tax, the TIF district for downtown Downers Grove rolls off. Mm -hmm. And that makes all of that new property eligible and goes into that new property number. Remember when I talked about that ratio and that percentage piece? that really puts a larger piece in and allows that, that rate to adjust to increase revenue for the district. Um, it's also why the CPI is important um, because if that CPI is less than 1%, um, we don't have that, we, you, that, that, what we're estimating right now is that TIF will be the equivalent of the 2.3 or a little better than that um, for this year. So we won't have that huge influx that we had been looking at and projecting, you know, in our five-year projections out the last couple of years. So that, you know, it'll be inter it will, we will watch carefully to see what that CPI is, and that'll have an impact uh, when we start talking about fiscal year 22, 23, and then 24. Um, but you can see even uh, over the last several years, uh, the growth in, in valuation has continued. Um, last year, 2019, had a 2.8% growth in, in, in existing property growth. Uh, before that, it was a 3.6, 4.75, so forth. 
So things have come back up in valuation, which is also a, you know, something to be said about the community and the supports that, um, that, you know, that is happening and, and the value of, of, of the community that people place on it by the sale prices of homes. Because that's largely what that is. I mean, there's certainly commercial property into that piece, but the predominance is, is, is residential. So the 2019 levy, uh, which was last year, uh, we levied uh, 58.7. We received uh, the final extension was 57.6. The district, and we were going to ask you to approve a levy next month in November, like as I said, and we, we know the CPI. We don't know the total EAV, and we don't know the new property. We actually don't get a firm number. We'll get some estimates, hopefully, along the way, but we won't have a firm number until... March or April. So when we estimate on our, you know, on our levy, we need to make sure we estimate at a level so that we anticipate what is normal. And you know, we, we budget on the low and be conservative. And we want to make sure that we're levying um, above that and above what we think might actually happen and above you know, that piece so that we don't miss out. Because once you miss out, you miss it out forever. Uh, and that you know that that's an incremental piece that grows in. As I said, it's a large piece of our revenue, and we are uh, limited on resources. Uh, our final tax rate is dollar ninety-five uh, for operational funds um, overall, and that was the twenty nineteen levy. You can see the twenty nineteen extension at fifty-seven point six. The proposed levy that we would bring to you next month. Um, and again, we do have a meeting scheduled with the assessors next week or so, um, a, a Zoom meeting that we have, and we'll maybe have some estimates. I don't know, I don't see this going up too, too much more, but um, we're, you know, a proposed levy of about $60.2 million. You can see we did some things. Um, one of the things we do in the tax levy process is we look at fund balance from year to year in, in each fund. And I think you know, when you look at your recap uh, that you receive as part of your budget uh, and as part of our projections, uh, the Ed Fund has taken hits. We have all of our state money that goes into it uh, as much of the corporate personal property replacement tax money, which is uh, funds that can go in any, any fund uh, into the education fund. Uh, so we need to, to start concentrating on that. And we look at our fund balances in, in, in the operation side and the transportation side, um, as well as in, the, in those pension, those IMRF and Social Security. And the fund balances are, are good for what the expenses are and what the revenue is. So we're making some adjustments along the way uh, to really increase the, the dollar amount um, into that ed, ed fund when we put the levy together. So that when the whole thing comes out at the end, you know, we're, we're pushing additional re revenue in. Now we'll do that for one year. We may have to adjust a little bit back down on transportation O and M, depending on expenses from year to year. But that's kind of our you know our structure each year we look at. <coughs> Oops. This is the last slide that we have. Um, we have talked about this. Uh, structure a little bit in previous presentations I think in the spring what this chart is um, is we went back to the 2019 uh, tax base and we get a report that's um, the tax base is EAV per student and then we take the tax rates and we come up with and we compare what would it be what kind of resources would the district have if we looked at the EAV per student for other area districts? And how much more would that be in our annual budget? Oh. Downers Grove is very, very fortunate that it has a low tax rate. It has a low tax rate because it has a strong base. It also has a low tax rate because it has traditionally had a low tax rate and has not had a, a referendum in some time to, to increase that. Um, 
or that it was before 1992 increased accordingly, you know, as such. Um, to take the extreme, if, our, if we were, our neighbor Hinsdale and had the EAV, the, the, the local resources and their ta you know, tax rate versus their, um, their property per student, that would be an additional $27 million into the, into the budget. Um, if we were at Center Cass, it would be a million dollars. Um, Woodridge, uh, our other neighbors, is almost $8 million that we would have. They have a much higher tax rate. They've had some referendums, um, you know, in the last two, two decades um, and so forth. So you can see what those, what those numbers are. Um, if you're on the other side and if we were at Addison, we would have $19 million less. Um, now, there's also some tiering in here. We don't, have, we don't look at what the differential is um, because some of these are, when you look at West Chicago and Addison, have additional state revenue because they're a different tier in the evidence-based funding model um, that the state contributes to. So there are some additional resources that they have uh, that we may not. Now, they don't necessarily make up $20 million uh, that Addison has, but, you know, they... Um, they do help out with some of those, some of the piece. Uh, obviously, Hinsdale and some others are close to, you know, our same similar tier or, or higher level. They receive less state revenue than we do. Um, but we always want you know, to point out the differentials of local resource availability uh, that um, other areas have uh, to what we have available. So. With that, um, that um, concludes the presentation. If there are any questions. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, is there any questions? Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Appreciate Todd. it. Yeah. Next time. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Todd. Okay, listed on tonight's agenda are 27 communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to have shared at this time? Okay, we'll go on to some reports to the board. We'll go ahead and start off with the superintendent report with Dr. Russell. Thank you. Prior to discussing the items in the superintendent's report, I would like to once again express our most sincere condolences to the family of Allison Manning. Allison's compassion, kindness, friendliness and wonderful spirit will live on forever at Hillcrest and in District 58. Our hearts are broken and we will do our very best to live each day so that she is proud of all of us. To the Manning family and the Hillcrest community, we are here to support you in any way that you need. Our most deepest sympathies from your District 58 family. To begin the superintendent's report, I'd like to start by talking about facilities and the Pierce Downer roof. Immediate capital repairs or improvements circles back to a handful of needs that must be addressed, including failing building envelope and asphalt pavement areas. The largest cost piece of these immediate needed repairs is the Pierce Downer roof. You may recall from earlier this year that the Pierce Downer roof was installed in 2001 and is the oldest roof in the district. Roofs are typically warranted or warranted for 20 years, although there are many exclusions. In short, the Pierce Downer roof is showing some visible signs of an aging roof that should be expected for PVC membrane of its age. Throughout the summer, we engaged in conversations with a few roofing engineer consultants. These engineers are specialists that provide engineering services to clients pertaining to building maintenance, including roof repair, maintenance, and replacement. Through this process, we felt most comfortable with a firm named InSpec. InSpec currently serves several other districts in this capacity. They are an engineering firm focused on the smart engineering of roofs, walls, pavements, and waterproofing. INSPEC was asked to do an independent condition assessment of the Pierce Downer Roof in August. Their conclusions, recommendations, and opinions presented are based on historical construction documents and on-site visual observations of the existing conditions. The recent assessment confirmed that no other short-term repairs should be made to the existing roof as it will no longer be cost-effective to extend the existing service life of the roof system. In addition, based on their recent work, they have recommended that the older roof sections, not including the 2013 addition area, surfaces are to a point that water is infiltrating the system, saturating a significant portion, estimated around 30% of the roofing areas. For those reasons, INSPECT is recommending a full replacement of the roof. 
Later in the meeting, we will ask the board to approve a contract with INSPECT for roof design and engineering services. For this next section of the report, um, I'm gonna ask Justin Sissel to team up with me after I make some opening remarks about our return to learn plan. And you can see we have a presentation here, which is not typical for the superintendent's report, but knowing that this wasn't uh, necessarily a discussion item tonight, we wanted to take some time and, and update our community as promised uh, that we would do two weeks ago. Next week begins a monumental week in District 58 as we begin the careful process of returning to a sense of school like it was this past March. I know that I am feeling both excitement and a sense of unfamiliarity as I think about what next Tuesday will bring and what lies ahead. The work that the entire team has done has also been monumental. Teachers, principals, and administrators, board members have been working tirelessly, as have our students and families. The district has been following a methodical process to implement our plan and resume hybrid learning next week while also offering a full remote instructional model. Over the past two weeks, we have met with grade level working groups, nurses, principals, parents, and have had multiple meetings with the district's three associations, our teachers, custodial maintenance employees, and educational support personnel. The district has been reviewing all of the details of the protocols, going through our safety measures with a fine tooth comb, listening to questions from each group or team, addressing their concerns and communicating with everyone about the safety measures and different components of the plan. We also used our experience with transition days to review our measures and practices. We know that these meetings are time consuming, but they are also essential. We have a history of collaborating with our teachers and staff in this district. And while that means the process takes longer and is more cumbersome, it also means that our plans and procedures are more robust, which in the end benefits our students and staff. When we had time to plan, revise, train, review, and fine tune plans for remote learning, the result was a very successful program that many parents embraced. In fact, it was so successful that some parents want to continue remote learning for the remaining semester. We are doing the same methodical planning with the opening of schools for hybrid learning. Also this week, we are following up on the plan to develop grade level teaching assignments. We asked parents earlier this month to choose between hybrid and person learning versus remote learning and asked about each child's transportation needs. The survey showed that approximately 84% of our students will be placed in a hybrid model and 16% are in full remote. We determined transportation needs last week and assigned students to AM or PM sections at the elementary level and notified them on Friday, October 9th of their assignment. Now we are finalizing classroom assignments. We are a little ahead of schedule and so elementary parents should have um, received those today. And the middle school schedule is much more nuanced and that's taking some time and, and we're in the final stages of that process. While the middle school schedule is often a digital process, much of it now is being done manually because of the uniqueness of this year to group cohorts together and minimize movement in the school. So it does take a lot more time when you're doing something by hand and then trying to figure out all the singleton classes. Again, all of this is following a timetable that we communicated in August and in September. As I mentioned to the staff in our newsletter today, you've got this. Our team has been methodical in approaching this new model and while there undoubtedly will be bumps, our staff and teachers' commitment to students and their time on this plan will help ensure a smooth start on Tuesday. For the next section of my report, I will team up with Mr. Sissel, Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction, to provide further details of the plan and answer some common questions that we've received. Three of the most common questions I've received are, number one, why not wait to the end of the trimester to make a switch? In my opinion, the reality is there will never be an ideal date that everyone will be able to get behind for a perfect time to change. I've received numerous messages about why we are taking so long, and I've also received numerous messages about why we're moving too fast. When we went full remote, we did so because we needed more clarifying information from the state. We stated that we would attempt to go back on August, excuse me, October 5th. We delayed that time frame to have two weeks to meet and plan with staff. The guidance from the State Board of Education states that we should emphasize in-person instruction, and that is what I have always advocated for as superintendent. I strongly believe that students learn best in person. However, I also strongly believe that we need to provide a remote, or excuse me, a robust remote option, as many of our students have pre-existing conditions or have a family member that has a pre-existing condition, and we owe it to them to make sure that we have two solid instructional models. Another question that I get is why do some teaching assignments have to change? This is not something that any of us ever wanted to have to recommend. However, it's simply impossible to offer on-site that adheres to the social distancing guidelines in our district, 
provide a remote instructional model, and make everything work. I wish this was not the case, but the reality is that we need to do this to make everything work. But we approached it in a way that minimizes this to the greatest extent possible. Another question I received over the last two weeks is why weren't all of the fine details mapped out prior to board approval of the plan? While the framework was presented and approved, we could not finalize everything until we had firm commitments from our families. This is the chicken and the egg phenomenon. This required sending out a commitment form and allowing parents to ask questions. I've also received criticism as to why the FAQ wasn't sent out until Friday night prior to the commitment form being due on a Monday. Please know I am not one to ever make excuses. But there are only so many hours in a day. We have a very thin bench in terms of administrative personnel and are working around the clock to meet with staff, plan, and take feedback from stakeholders. The reason the FAQ was sent out at that time was because that was the quickest our team could turn it around. We needed time to thoroughly prepare and review this document prior to sending it out. Finally, since I've become superintendent, I have always been asked how staff feel about any potential plan. If we present a plan that does not incorporate feedback from the staff, we would be subject to intense criticism and not have staff buy-in. We wanted a plan that allowed parents to ask questions and staff to provide input. The bottom line is that a process like this takes time to go through. I know that two weeks seems like a long time, but we have accomplished a great deal in a relatively quick time frame. During these tough times, there is no single plan or solution that will satisfy everyone. I truly wish there was. However, I can assure the community that we are listening and taking their feedback. I am confident that we will again deliver quality experiences for our students. And so to shift here, we have a slide that shows our commitment data. We had a very thin line on there that had students we weren't able to get in touch with. I, I want to commend all of our building office staffs and, and James Eichmiller because that thin line has completely disappeared. So we have got all of our families to commit and right now we have 84.2% have selected hybrid and 15.8 have selected full remote. When you look at the percentages by school, you'll see that that does vary a little bit. We have some schools that are close to 100%, and then we have um, one school that's close to 70%, but in general terms, you're, you're between the mid-70s and the mid-90s in terms of on-site instruction. In terms of grade level, you'll see there isn't much variance. Now, you may look at this and go, what is minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four? We don't send kids back in grades. That's how we code the preschool data. So that those are different sections of preschool. What this chart doesn't show you, obviously, is how many students are in each grade level. But um, in terms of the preschool, those are much smaller numbers than what you would see across all the other grade levels. Then we surveyed all of the students in the district. So of those students that are coming back, 18.3 have indicated that they want bus service if they're eligible for that. Um, so we will be providing bus services we discussed uh, before. So now I'd like to turn it over to Justin uh, to provide some clarification, first and foremost, about trimesters and reporting. We also know that we have some questions about what asynchronous instruction is going to look like, map testing, those sorts of things, and so we wanted to provide uh, some clarity. We will also follow up with our families via a letter to summarize this because we do recognize that not everybody has a chance to tune into the board meetings. Thank you. So when we talk about this transition, one of the things we do have to address is the, that there is, it is in fact a transition, and so that means that we have to consider our reporting periods and our marking periods and how we'll handle that. And so when we begin that consideration, the first thing is to look back at what is the ultimate purpose and aim and goal of any reporting method. And, and this text comes from our website, which comes from report card committee work over the years. And really the primary function of our report card or any reporting system is to provide feedback to parents and students about how things are going at a certain moment in time. And so typically, we have learning standards that are addressed in, grade, in preschool through eighth grade. We typically use letter grades with fourth through eighth grade students as an additional method of reporting. And typically, we use a 12-week period before we would issue such a report. We, that has been determined to be a good length of time to have an opportunity to really receive adequate evidence on a number of standards. 
in this moment, this transition is about to happen after really six weeks of instruction. And, and candidly, we usually, if one trimester of the three is going to be longer, we typically lengthen the first trimester, recognizing that in those initial weeks of school, there is a lot of getting to know students and building relationships and learning those things. We also look to ISBE guidance in all of these times. And whereas in the spring, ISBE's guidance was very much around grading should, should do no harm and really should be extraordinarily flexible, there, there's been a shift in that guidance to consider returning to methods that parents and families are used to receiving as information around student progress with the understanding that we still need to provide flexibility and be able to modify those methods of reporting to meet the current needs that we have. And so as we considered how to handle this first trimester or this transition point, that is the first thing we talked about is the idea that really there is a value in marking a clear transition from one model to the next because we truly are moving into a very different instructional model. Even students who are going to be in the fully remote model will have a very different experience than they've had for the past six weeks. And so those first two bullets recognize that. I've already mentioned the overall length of this instructional period. While there is absolutely valuable learning and assessing that has been happening during this time, it's also half of the time we would usually take to make some of those summative assessments and, and, and sort of formal reporting decisions around student progress. We also know that the consistency of communication is important. There were conversations as our report card committees met, which are made up of teachers and administrators. There were conversations about modifying the reporting method to reflect more clearly what was happening, but we really landed back on the idea that we've established a reporting mechanism with our, our report card with the standards markings and the letter grades that is familiar and comfortable. And the feedback that we've received over the years from families when we've surveyed them around reporting is that those grades are actually one of the most informative pieces because they're something that, that families can generally relate to, along with the standards information, all of that second to direct feedback and communication with teachers, obviously. We also wanted to make sure that we are clearly reporting information and, and meeting our responsibility to share information. We, we definitely felt like we wouldn't want to wait until after the calendar year to send some sort of update to families that gives that moment in time snapshot of what's there. And then obviously these six weeks have been unique and, and you know, will be unique to our future plans this year and, and hopefully to anything we experience going forward. And so the desire really was to balance all of that while recognizing the value and quality of the instruction and feedback that's been happening, but also acknowledging that we typically wouldn't make a formal report upon standards and grades with this length of instruction. So at this point then, the decision was made to conclude the marking period on Thursday, on October 15th, the day before we make this transition. And then as we thought about this, we recognized that we really did want to differentiate between a report card that would occur at the end of a trimester. Rather, we want to call it a trimester one progress report so that we are meeting our obligations of communication, recognizing a moment in time, but also being sure to differentiate this from a report card. And so some of the ways we're going to do that um, are listed on these bullets. We're, we're not going to make this a printed paper document that we're going to send home with each student so it, it doesn't have the feeling of that thing we typically put on, on the refrigerator in some households. Unless a family requests it, then we certainly can generate a printed copy. We're going to attach language to this so that whenever the progress report is viewed, there will be an immediate visual reminder that this is an atypical scenario and this represents progress at a moment in time in a, in a unique instructional experience. And the other piece we want to be careful of is then when we do have a second trimester report card, which returns back to our typical formal method of reporting, this progress report information will not be a part of that communication. So when report cards are generated in winter and then again the, the, the year end report card which does go into a student's file, that report card will only have the true formal reporting periods of second trimester and third trimester and won't reflect this progress report information as a way to just further differentiate what we're doing now from what we would typically do. So that progress report will become available to families on October 30th, which is the typical interval between when we would end the marking period and release that reporting. The, report, the progress report will include um, information on standards that, that teachers feel have been sufficiently taught and assessed to give that moment in time indicator at this, at, at this juncture. 
that means that all of those trimester one essential standards that we developed so diligently will not necessarily be addressed on the progress report because that full list was intended to cover a 12-week teaching span. And so our next step then is to fold that work into determining the trimester two essential standards that will ultimately all be included in a trimester two report card. We're going to include some information on learner behaviors. These, have to, these, are, the, these are student behaviors, some of which are very observable during remote learning, others of which are less observable or, or less under a student's control in a remote learning situation. So we've identified some of those. We are going to see letter grades for middle school students as part of the progress report. However, we want to emphasize that we're, we're terming these non-binding. This is the letter grade that would be received at this moment in time. However, we recognize that this moment in time is not the typical time that we would assign a letter grade. And so we're also going to work, we've heard some concerns about high school placement impact and things like that. And the reality is all of the data sets that typically influence high school placement are going to need to be considered uniquely based on the experiences we've had through the pandemic and through instruction. And so we're already beginning conversations with District 99 to ensure that we can clearly articulate what any of the data means and help to interpret how we have approached it with the high school process so that there is an appropriate and, and um, equitable assignment of class placement when we get for these eighth graders in particular. We'll also, again, as I mentioned, have that clear language on the progress report. And then as Kevin mentioned, we'll be sending a letter out tomorrow that will include this information in narrative form for our families so that everyone has an opportunity to review this. Another topic that we mentioned for just brief discussion tonight is what is that asynchronous time? What's the day going to look like for our students? And this was a question that was brought up a couple of weeks ago. Our preschool students will receive 90 minutes of synchronous instruction, and, and that's that live instruction. So either if, they, if they've elected hybrid, that happens in person. If they've elected fully remote, that happens via Zoom. And then 60 minutes of asynchronous instruction. And for preschool, they're going to continue to use the choice boards, which have been really well received at that age level by our families and by our teachers in terms of a way to provide meaningful activities that can be completed with the support that's available at home for our preschool students. For our kindergarten students, that 150 minutes of live instruction, again, whether it's on site or whether it's via Zoom if we're fully remote, covers the half day of kindergarten time that we have established for this year as our kindergarten program. So our kindergarten students will receive no specific additional asynchronous instruction with the, the, the exception of moments where we might finish up something that was worked on during class at home in, in one way or another, just like we would in a typical year. Our students in grades one through six will receive that 150 minutes of synchronous instruction daily, whether it is that, that live instruction, whether that's on site or via Zoom, if, I've chosen, if they've chosen fully remote, and then an additional 150 minutes of off-site instruction. And so I think some of the detail that we've been asked to provide is on this slide. Now the table looks at weekly minutes, and that is purposeful because we really want to give some flexibility in terms of obviously there will be reading and math happening on site every day, but there could be an extended writing project that might take longer on a given day. Or we might choose to use some of those science and social studies synchronous on-site minutes in a different way on one particular day. Social and emotional learning is another example where a couple days a week we might have a 10 minute morning meeting and then a couple days a week we may dive into a 20 or 25 minute more specific explicit social emotional learning lesson. So generally speaking on the left hand side, that's what that live time will look like. Then on the right hand side, we see those, those mostly asynchronous pieces. Um, reading and language arts and math are going to have off-site asynchronous components as well. Some of that will be natural extension of what's happened during the on-site or live time. Some of that will be material that is specifically created to be used asynchronously. And as we talk about that asynchronous instructional material, we also understand the responsibility to make sure that it is developmentally able to be done relatively independently. And so we're spending a lot of time differentiating between what a fifth grader and sixth grader might be able to do at home, which might look a little more like some, some typical homework, whereas we know a first grader typically wouldn't have two and a half hours of independent homework. So the activities for those grade levels need to be able to be accessed where items are being read to students and there are pieces that are being created. And so, as a district right now, our instructional coaches and our curriculum coordinators are creating these asynchronous activities for the first three weeks, few weeks, excuse me, for grades one through five and supplementing for grade six as we go forward so that we are able to ensure that teachers can have something to begin with and give us some feedback upon and then we'll determine as we go forward what the creation of those materials will look like. The one synchronous piece of off-site instruction consistently will be the elementary specials. So once per week, beginning the week of October 26th, 
we will have a, a 30 minute art lesson or music and, and music lesson two PE lessons and a library skills lesson that'll happen once daily for each student so you will have that synchronous zoom with your specials teacher and then the remainder of the work will connect to what has happened in the on-site experience as we think about what this is going to look like at the beginning we want to emphasize first science and social studies may vary week to week as we you know as we create some of these initial experiences first through fifth grade we are going to focus primarily on science asynchronous instruction so there will be some social studies but really relatively little whereas the science will take the front seat and that part of that honestly is a function of the creation of all of those materials and making sure we have the capacity to do them at a high level that we expect Part of it too is just some of the consistency of instruction as we are learning this asynchronous piece. It's one less variable to introduce if we can focus on lesser, less content areas. I also wanna be sure we mention each time we talk about this transition that that feedback that's been received through remote learning on all of those individual seesaw activities, that is going to look a little bit different with this asynchronous piece. First, not all, not all activities may be delivered via seesaw, but many still will be. The activity of submitting that seesaw activity when the teacher approves it, it's going to, to, to be more of a, I've received it, than you're going to anticipate individual feedback. The feedback piece is really going to be focused in those live moments, so we will be referring to the asynchronous work and discussing it and, and, and having those opportunities, but it, it won't necessarily be that same level of individual feedback we've seen on some of the, the seesaw activities thus far. We also want to emphasize that during off-site time, teachers certainly are available to support students and answer their questions. They just can't walk away from the students in front of them to do that. So it's going to be very similar to what it would be in a typical year, that teachers will be responsive, but while they are in front of another group of students, they just simply can't be immediately responsive in that way. And then the other piece that I want to be sure we're clear about is this is a major transition. And so the minutes on the previous slide are where we are headed and what we expect to see happening. But in these first few days especially, there are a lot of new routines to establish. There is a lot of learning in terms of how we're going to access that asynchronous material and what that's going to look like. And so we are going to be building up to those things. In, in the first couple of days, both for on-site and fully remote, we are reestablishing classroom communities. We are reestablishing routines and procedures and protocols. And so that will take over some of the time that would have been reserved for academic instruction as we build up, just as it would in a typical year. So just in the interest of making sure that our expectations are clear for everyone. For example, in those first three days, we won't see science and social studies primarily. We're gonna see a focus on SEL, reading and math, and building all those routines. And then we'll build the additional content in as the next week begins. As far as middle school, the middle school students follow the same eight period day each day and if they are on, if they are a hybrid then they will be on site on a given day and then follow an eight period schedule and follow the same schedule at the same time on their off site day remotely. So the asynchronous piece for middle school really is the typical homework piece that kind of tacks on to those, cl to those classes that they would receive. That's, how, that's where we um, come up with that full 300 minutes as we go through. Um, and then again, we've mentioned before, we are, what used to be an early bird class is now happening at the end of the day so that we don't complicate the arrival procedures for everyone, but those, those extra class periods will exist for our band choir and orchestra, orchestra students, excuse me, as well. The last thing I just want to touch on because there's been some conversation around this are the map assessments. So as of tomorrow, we will have concluded our fall map window, which means we will have administered map remotely in math and reading to all students in grades two through eight. We've received some questions about why do this now? And, and there are a couple of, of tangible reasons for that. One of the, one of the reasons is the, the distance between the last data set that we have. The last map assessment that our students took was in December of 2019. So that is one consideration. Another is that NWEA requires us to have a minimum of eight weeks of instruction between assessments in order to provide growth data for us. So that so the, the NWA system sets those growth targets and we use that as, as a, a metric we value. So if we wait too long, we wouldn't be able to set up a growth window between fall and winter and then between winter and spring. And then the other piece really is thinking about, you know, there was some conversation on, well, could we just do that when we're on site? Wouldn't that be easier? And it certainly would have been easier, but there's also that, you know, what do we want to greet our students with as they're coming back on site? Is that going to be 90 minutes or two hours in front of a computer at those first precious on-site times? And in any case, our fully remote students still would have been taking the assessment remotely. Um, at this point, kindergarten and first grade students did not take this assessment. The 
Two primary reasons for that have to do with the fact that the kindergartners never have and the first graders have once. They're the least familiar with it. The second is the technology component. Because for kindergarten and first grade, the assessment is auditory, where they are on headphones listening to it, what would have to happen with the iPads is it would close out of everything else. So our students in second grade and up could have a concurrent Zoom screen open to troubleshoot with teachers. It would have left our youngest learners with no connection to their teachers while they were taking the assessment. So at this point, with everything else that's out there, we intend to begin map testing for kindergarten and first grade with the winter administration. We will, however, be administering on site and, and then remotely for the fully remote students some individual assessments to make sure we have good information about where these students are at at this moment in time. We'll discuss district map data much further in a couple of weeks and we will be mailing home individual student map data um, also that week of the curriculum workshop in the paper format that we used to do a couple of years ago. We're going to return to that for right now. The other reminder I'll make now that I'll emphasize a lot in a couple of weeks is this data set is unique in a number of ways. And so while we are very trained on how to interpret map numbers as a district and as a community, we want to be cautious not to overinterpret this data set in any direction. And I say that not having pulled the information. I'm not predicting anything in, a, in either direction. But we just want to recognize that from environmental factors to the suspension of in-person instruction last spring, there are a number of anomalies with any data set that we're pulling right now. And so we just want to be careful to interpret it with all of that in mind. So Justin, just one quick question. You, you said that it's going to be printed and sent home, and, but that's just a, a temporary thing? At this moment, we are no longer updating Squirrel, which, is our, which had been our data information system. So we're working, toward a, we're working toward new digital solutions. In the meantime, we want to make sure that families have access to both current and historical scores for comparison. So we'll be sending home the progress, the paper progress report that for those of us that have been in the district for a few years with kids will remember that was our, that was our typical communication for many years until we switched over to inviting parents only to look into the online data system. And then one of the things that I, I had a number of parents ask me is how do I get the historical data if I can't get in a squirrel? Every time we print out a student progress summary report in NWEA map, it will show every student that that, or excuse me, every test that that student has taken, fall, winter, spring, whenever, whenever those were assessed. So every parent will have at their fingertips all the historical data that they were seeking there. Um, one of the questions that we have gotten is why don't we have squirrel anymore? Um, squirrel is a unique creation for District 58, and you know, when we looked at our budget and our financial strains and, and had to make some tough decisions as we added new things into our district, that was one of the decisions that we had to make because we simply can't do it all. Every year you look at a school district and the new requirements that get thrust upon it. And so that was one of the things that we took a look around and said, you know, this is a unique thing to District 58. There are other ways to get parents that historical data and to sign up for parent-teacher conferences. And so that was a budgetary decision uh, that we made, uh, and I, I do recognize that some parents really did like Squirrel. However, every year more things add on, and, and we're just simply not able to keep up at the same pace because the funds don't necessarily uh, coincide with that. I apologize, Tracy. I think I cut you off there. I'm sorry. I th you, uh, you paused for a second, so I took advantage of that. Um, with the, the printouts, I don't remember. Um, does it show, like, for, for math, for instance, how it broke it down by geometry and it, or even with ELA, there was, it wasn't just the map, the, mm -hmm. the, it was broken down by like critical or geometry, you know how it's all broken down into different categories, will that, all that stuff be on that sheet as well? Student yes, yeah. um, so on the student progress report, you can see the breakdowns of the sections, the subsets of the test. It does, and okay. Yeah, so all on of that information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And, as long as I'm, um, <laughs> the map data, would, would that be, or will we be seeing um, results of that at the curriculum workshop? At the district level, like we typically would, yes. We'll, we'll, we'll Just share like that. normal. Yeah. Well, nothing is normal, but well, yes, we'll show the, we, will show, we will show the map numbers Amen. from the fall. Yes, absolutely. Okay. The, the one word of caution that I would get everyone about this data set, and I think NWA and all our testing companies are, are, are going to discuss this, is the norming data that they have is based on typical years and typical performance. And so some of the norming data that is used may not be as relevant as it used to be. And so NWA is quickly working to you know, look at that and assess that. Um, we'll run into the same thing when we have to start taking our state testing again. So 
Again, the norming data may not quite be where it needs to be with some of this, but, but again, we'll take a look at that and present that at the um, October curriculum workshop. Thank you. Uh, so, Justin, on the topic of BAMP, um, I heard you say we have to be very careful to not to overinterpret the data, um, and I completely understand that. This is this is um, it's we're not we have to be very careful about the conclusions we draw from this data, understanding that the, the students haven't been in, in a classroom setting properly for seven months. Um, I guess, though, however, just I have it's a three-part question. So, if you'll indulge me, um, can you just tell me kind of what how you expect our staff to use that data? How do you expect that uh, to guide decision making, to plan interventions, to make adjustments to, um, to curricula? Um, but my, the three part is how, how do you expect that to be done at the classroom level, at the building level, at the district level? So the, the short answer is we're, we're going to review the data using the systems that we typically would. So obviously the district level data will be reviewed at the curriculum workshop and we'll look for, you know, we can compare fall to fall a couple of years ago. We, there will be some, some comparisons we'll be able to draw and, and think about that as it, as it relates to where cohorts are, although there will be kind of a cohort gap for this particular set, but there won't be for the winter set. You know, in terms of at the buildings and the classrooms, we will be holding those same times to have some data conversations, particularly as we as we conclude receiving this data and as new classes are formed. You know, that is really one of the things that is possible to be looked at at the school improvement planning day on this on Friday the 23rd. It may not happen across the board everywhere, but I know that I know that our, our interventionists and reading specialists, for example, are eager to get their hands on some of that to really compare it to, and this is the important part, to compare it to what we have seen and observed with the assessments that we've been doing and the work we've been doing with students over the past several months. And so that's really what we always ask for is to take the standardized and formal data we have alongside the observational data that we have and the classroom assessment data. And, and, and yes, I mean, we will be using that to determine if we, you know, to think about intervention planning, to think about differentiation and grouping and things like that. I think the, you know, the, the, the not over-interpret piece is really that caution to make sure that if, it, if, you know, and this is true in any year, honestly, if one number seems like a significant outlier, we won't use that to move a student further into a group that doesn't seem to make sense from an educator lens. But we will be following the same procedures and practices that we would in terms of reviewing the data and, and, and using it for, you know, for instructional decision making, yes, alongside all the other things. I think the, the other thing I'm trying to be careful of as we talk about not over-interpreting is some of our long-term use of trend data when we would look at that. So I would be, if, if this fall data point was the, the one in a trend that was going to influence a decision, that's where I think we're going to have to look at even when we talk about future math acceleration and gifted eligibility and yes, high school placement, we're going to have to look carefully at what this looks like in relation to the trend, which is also why it's nice to have this number so that we can then have the winter and the spring to compare it to. Thank you. Yep. I just have um, two quick questions. Uh, one kind of piggybacks off what, what something you just said about the high school placement, mm -hmm. and there's just been a lot of conversation in the past couple days around um, this first trimester reporting and, and how that works, especially I think for middle schoolers, even more so than elementary. Um, it seems that those, like uh, that grade is, is so much more significant. And I just was just wondering, um, Aside from the the hard data and the grades that would follow a student to from 58 to 99, is there any sort of um, more of like a narrative or literal like verbal conversations that happen between teachers at the middle schools and teachers in 99 as those students move from from one district to the other that help to determine placement? Yeah, it's not. It isn't a student by student articulation process necessarily, but it, there is a there is a teacher recommendation component to most where where there are tracks in high school to mm -hmm. most of those decision making components. Mm -hmm. Typically, the high school will give us more of a here's what we're looking at based on data. Tell us what you think, as opposed to you know that that's kind of the way it's evolved to write in the past couple of years. But you know, really, the the high school has also been District 99 has also been very good about working with us on the data that we have and and making their systems acknowledge what's there. For example, last year when we didn't have fall math, when we had removed that from our assessment calendar, they were able to adapt and use a combination of other data points. And again, those teacher recommendations mm -hmm. to ensure that we have a, a full set of information to, to pass on to them as they're making decisions. And, and absolutely, in, in, in situations where it isn't clear, there, there, there certainly are individual conversations between typically department chairs and mm -hmm. our eighth grade teachers. Okay, perfect. Um, my other question was um, about special services, and this is really for, for preschool all the way through eighth grade. Um, 
speech, occupational therapy, social work, things like that, are those all, are we planning on trying to accomplish all of those during the synchronous time or a combination or how is that looking or is that more case by case basis? It is, ex it is ex I'm gonna try this Jessica and you can jump in if I don't do it right. <laughs> there is, there, it is really case by case and, and that's actually true of intervention support and EL support and things like that. We, there, there are situations where that on site will be the most important time to do it and so then we'll make some prioritization decisions about that. Mm -hmm. There are cases where delivering services remotely may be more appropriate and so, or, or more feasible and so then we can, we can capture some of that time. You know, again, sometimes there is benefit to adding live synchronous time for students who need additional support rather than supplementing it with those, with those services. Okay. So it, it will be a case by case scenario. Okay. You have anybody else? I have one other question. I don't know if it falls here or some, a different part of the agenda, sure. but um, with Friday and Monday um, being the um, in-service days for teachers and as well as which weren't initially on the calendar, plus the 23rd, would you, could you kind of briefly walk through like what is, is that the time the teachers are going to be working on what, what happens next week or what, what is that? What's so the I'll, calendar or agenda look like? I'll jump in. I'll let Justin do the specifics, but I want the community to, to know why we're taking those days. If you remember back at, um, way back in June, on June 23rd, when the initial guidance came out, one of the things that the state of Illinois did was they recognized that transitions like this would have to take place. And so they gave us five planning days in order to utilize. We used three of those planning days at the start as we were heading into remote learning. And these two days, the 16th and the 19th, are the remaining two of those planning days as, as we discussed at the last meeting. Friday the 23rd was already in the schedule as a, um, an improvement day for, for the school district and, and we're very hesitant to ever take days off of the schedule because parents already make plans and things like that around those. And so those are, that's those three days. I'll let Justin fill in on the, the specifics. Sure. So the, the 16th and the 19th have a few specific targets. One of them is, yes, the preparation for the return to on-site instruction and all of the physical things that go along with that, the arrangement of classrooms, the, the, the redevelopment and reestablishment of some of those protocols and, and, and procedures and markings and things like that and, and, and preparing. Again, it's been, the transition days were wildly successful, but it's been a while since we've done that. And so there, there, there's going to be some time for that. There's going to be some time for teacher articulation. So conversations about students that I have had for six weeks that I am now sending to you as another teacher, whether that's in a remote section or in an on-site section, so that we can get some, some general information. Here are some strategies that I found successful. Here are some areas that we've been supporting this student in so that you can continue those things seamlessly. Also preparing communication for families and for students. Our elementary homerooms will be having those Zoom sessions on Monday afternoon to welcome the new classroom um, communities together. It'll, do, you know, it'll be a couple of 10, 15 minute sessions, but just a chance to prepare for that, that, that sort of next first day as, as we're coming back on site. And also, you know, preparing, some of, again, some of that communication for families. And then, yes, there is, there is some degree of we are shifting the instructional model here. And so conversations around what now will, that, will, will the instruction look like? You know, it, yes, we've taught on site before, but we haven't taught on site with these parameters using these materials. And so some, some work on preparing and some grade level collaboration time to really talk through what are some of those things going to look like and how are, what are these asynchronous materials going to be? How will I um, fold those into instruction? That's really the 16th and the 19th. The 23rd will contain s some of those pieces as well and also some, some time for buildings to reflect upon three days of on-site and fully remote instruction. And really, it's, it's a nice moment to have experienced three days and say, okay, these are things that are going really well. It also gives us a chance to quickly make some, some tweaks or some revisions if we need to, to our systems or our protocols or our instructional model, you know, in terms of how we're pre preparing and presenting materials so that we can continue to improve that right away. Super, thank you so much. Yep. So, um, I'll start off by saying that uh, school districts are not normally known for their agility. So I, you know, we often refer to this as driving a large ship as opposed to like a small company that might, might be a, a, a speedboat. And so I, I really want to acknowledge, I think, the level of effort that had to go in to this and also why sometimes things look a little bit incomplete. Very agile environments sort of build out something to 75% and then you start working in that environment as you, as you finish building it. So. Uh, I know this can be frustrating for a lot of people, our staff, our families, because we're sort of learning as we go. And, and so I appreciate everybody's patience from our staff, 
to the administration, to our families at home. Uh, with that, I think some of the nervousness that I was hearing regarding the model of the trimesters came in, in two fronts, and I just kind of want to get a little bit of a clarification here because I think it's important. And one was, all right, if, if, we, if we move forward, um, you know, my, my, you know, we're hearing this like uh, the, the kid is maybe changing staff members or, or whatever. So how do we get that knowledge transfer over? How do we, how do we work all of that? And because we're, we're midstream and I appreciate that. On the other front, if we just, you know, if we ended early, we were hearing, well, you know, I've got my child who maybe is missing a few things. Hey, they're working on their own. We've got two working parents. They're, probably, they're working at a cohort or something along those lines. It's not fair to assess them in this short period of time. At the same time, one of the things that we talked about is this is very different from last year in that this, is, this period is important and we're putting weight on it and we, we want to see it as measurable. So moving forward, if we sort of cap this off as a progress report, what are we doing to show that, that we are measuring this for our kids and holding them accountable mm -hmm. uh, to that level of work that's there? And are you then including the skills? I, I think you alluded to this, but I didn't fully understand it, so I wrote a note down. The skills that were expected of the first trimester, those are going to be reflected and measured in trimester two? So that, that is a yes and. The, some of the, the skills and standards that were, that were taught and, and, and expected in that sense in trimester one, some of those will be what you will see on the progress report, but not all of them because, you know, math is a great example where the, the standards and skills are a little bit more linear. So when you, when you take six weeks of instruction away from what you had intended to accomplish, you won't, have ac you won't have gotten to all of the standards, but you will have gotten to some of them. And so that's exactly the, the, the way we're trying to articulate this moment in time with the progress report. And so then those standards that we didn't, that we haven't gotten to yet sequentially because of the instructional time will then be brought onto trimester two along with the other standards that we would have anticipated addressing in trimester two because we are essentially lengthening the second trimester by a few weeks as we accomplish this as well. And so moving forward, should we require time where we're in remote again? We're seeing that is not requiring another major transition that we would be able to do. So that time would be able to be easily measured within that same trimester without having to go through something this systemic of a change here, right? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I would say yes, and for a couple of reasons. Part of it is that we don't anticipate teacher shifts if we would have to move back into full remote. But another part of it, too, is that it really is part of that, that choosing to make this a, a clean break is really acknowledging that we are moving from one specific instructional model for all students to another specific instructional model, model for all students, uh, you know, pretty much across the board. And so I think that really is the, the delineation. The, the shift, if we were to be forced into a fully remote situation, the instructional model could continue seamlessly, the teachers could continue seamlessly, whereas right now we are seeing a transition that we are working to, to minimize the impact of, but we're recognizing that it is a significant transition. And what about on the, on the more positive side? Say we were able to, you know, say we were looking to do a shift uh, similar to what we were originally planning to do, uh, four hours on site, one hour off site for our uh, K through six. Do you see that same kind of transition? What I'm trying to avoid here is where we end up breaking these things into segments that become not measurable as, as we move forward. I don't think that that's fair to our families or, or, or students or our teachers as we try to evaluate. Where they, I know we have map assessments and other things as well, but um, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of people like to tack these things up on their, on their fridge or whatever. They put a lot of, of value in, in reading those things. I think the skill-based report card that was implemented a couple years ago gives us a lot of detailed look into how our, our students are performing. So I just kind of want to make sure that the trajectory we're putting ourselves on, we're able to then kind of stick to the standard now of what trimester two looks like and, and trimester three. I, 
I think that is absolutely the intent of what we're trying to do, and I think that the, the, the timing of review of all of this in January aligns much more closely to a trimester shift, and so were there even to be something, there's room to, to acknowledge that, but I, you know, I'm, I'm leery to predict the future, but I think that you know, we're, we are not anticipating another six month or another six week period right now that would be different than what we'd have been experiencing. And so I don't, I don't, I, I wouldn't, I would hope that we would not see another mid trimester shift that would cause us to have to consider something like that. Okay. Um, and then uh, with the creation of the asynchronous time, now some of this might be what's going to be focused on, on on Friday and Monday, but when we were here a few weeks ago, we were discussing that there was still I know that was a lot of concern amongst our staff in, in how we were going to find some of that. And it looks like you've already moved down some paths of, well, we'll do a little bit higher focus on science at one period of time and then a higher focus on social studies to kind of alleviate some of that work. Uh, is there any other clarification you can give us on that content development process, or is that something that's going to be clarified here in the next couple no, of days? I, I can certainly speak to that a little bit. We shared um, over, it was actually over the weekend, uh, a document with staff that gave some detail, and we've had optional meetings with each grade level that'll conclude tomorrow at you know 7.45 and 4 o'clock to just make sure questions are answered. Um, and, and really, our goal for at least these first few weeks is that all of that asynchronous material is developed for teachers so that they have enough to use without having to do independent creation of that. And so in reading, for example, our benchmark series has, there, there are slides created that are designed for asynchronous learning. They're designed to complement the synchronous time, the live reading time that would happen. And so that's a resource that the publisher has provided that we are tweaking and, and, and making our own, and that will be a component right away. The, similarly, there are materials within the Bridges curriculum that are able to be done and have been indicated by the publisher that these will be most successful. Our, again, our curriculum coordinators have been looking at that and really taking those pieces and, and lining it up for teachers to say, okay, when you do this day of on-site or live instruction, this is the asynchronous piece that will align with that, and here's how we can present it to students in a way that will allow them to access it without significant support. And so those pieces are already in the works. And then as I mentioned, we're developing a, a series of right now focusing on science for grades one through five and social studies for grade six, a series of similarly district created activities that will use our resources, use our district curricula, and, and yet provide it in a way that, that really teachers are able to review it, give a little bit of introduction, and present it to students, and then be able to discuss it. Now that, that creation plan may evolve, but in order to best support the transition and to, to answer the questions, Darren, that you mentioned about teacher concerns around that material, this is the approach we've had. The response, I, haven't, I haven't taken a formal survey, but the response from teachers on the Zoom meetings that we've been having has certainly been favorable. Thank you. Um, one, one last piece I, I just want to say. Um, obviously, everything that we're doing right now creates a lot of anxiety. You know, I, I think in our community, anytime you're in the middle of a transition, and so, um, I just appreciate everybody's patience and, and I appreciate all the feedback and, and time that you guys have had to spend on the phone with uh, people and, and kind of walking through that process. I, I just want to, I, I know that this report card process is a little bit confusing and I just want to make sure that we get that communication out and that we have a lot of clarity to that. I think one of the dangers we've had is as this stuff is getting built, bits and pieces get out in the community and create on, when you're already anxious about something to begin with, you know, what is this next phase going to look like? Do I want to send my, my student in person? Do I want to take the bus? Are there, is their teacher going to change? Or will I get AM or PM? All of those kind of things that I think has created anxieties in, in people's households, in, in, including mine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really important that we just try to make sure that we speak with real uh, clarity and, and make sure that people understand where this stuff is coming from because I think the last week we've seen a lot of, con I, I've personally heard a lot of concern over report cards and what is this going to mean, mm -hmm. and that sort of is where some of, the, some of these questions came from today as I just know that there's a lot of level of anxiety. So uh, getting that out and making sure that there's a lot of, that it's clear and concise and, and understandable I think is going to be incredibly important because it's very different from what we've done in the past. And I know we have a lot of concerns, so I, I appreciate your time. And Darren, uh, just to just to jump on that that yeah. comment, one of the things that I've often heard from parents is, I know you guys are so busy, I don't want to call you. Um, I would much rather have parents give us a call, whether that's their teacher, whether it's the building principal, whether it's one of the assistant superintendents, or even myself. I think one of the things that we see in in every community um, has this going on. Um, social media can be a very good thing. 
and it can be a very challenging thing at times. And, and you're right, you know, some, there are bits of information going out. And, and again, as I've stated numerous times, if we could have some do-overs, I'll give you a perfect example. When we had our um, newsletters go out this weekend, principals may have commuted, uh, or, uh, communicated that the grading period is ending October 19th. All of a sudden that caused people to say, well, wait a second, my kid has this grade or this grade, how can they do that or what does that mean? Um, a do-over would have been to wait till we have this meeting and then send out a letter. So, so I acknowledge that. I want to apologize to our community if they felt that stress because that certainly wasn't I I intended. I would have much rather though seen parents that they have questions, they are welcome to email, they are welcome to call. We, we are very responsive to those um, because otherwise what happens is it gets on social media and then it takes on a life of its own. And so I'd much rather be able to talk to parents and call them uh, and, and be able to solve that right there. So I do want to recognize that though, especially about the reporting. Again, if we had a do-over, um, we would have not put that out there or we would have put it out there with a lot more context. I, I'm not faulting our principals. I'll take the ownership of that. Um, that could have been a much more clear communication, and that did cause a lot of anxiety in our community. Uh, we certainly aren't perfect, and we own our mistakes, and that would have been one of them. So I, I do want to recognize that uh, with our community tonight. Thank you. Thank Any you. other questions for Justin? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Do you have any? Thank you. Anything else? That is it. Thank right. you. That I, was I have one other, th yeah. one other thing with the return, actually, for you. Yeah. Um, for the walkers going to school, do you, do you want to talk a little yeah, bit about that? Yeah, thank you, Tracy. And so um, Tracy's question is centered around crossing guards, and this information will be coming out. Um, I want to personally thank the village of Downers Grove. Um, as soon as we passed the return to learn plan for hybrid instruction, I placed a call to the village manager the very next morning, and Dave Fieldman and his team here at the village have gone above and beyond. I, I want to personally thank Bill Buds, who is uh, a police officer here who's in charge of crossing guards. Not only did they secure crossing guards for all of our normal elementary routes, they've also doubled them for us to meet the middle of the day. And uh, I, I think you know that is so nice of the village to do that. Uh, Bill and I have been working you know, together very closely on that. Um, Katie Hannigan also helps with that. So I want to thank our village, um, and I want to tell all the parents tonight, and again, we will communicate this out, that their children will be able to walk to school safely in the same manner uh, that they always have. I know I've gotten some calls, especially from the Pierce Downer neighborhood, that crossing at Oakwood and Prairie is always a, a major concern for people. And, and there are many others throughout the, the district. Uh, Highland has one right on uh, 39th Street right there in Highland Avenue. So uh, again, though, we will have our crossing guards out there, and uh, the village has secured the midday as well so uh that, that's very positive news for all of us thank you very much thank you all right moving on uh the monthly business and treasurer's report with todd drakel Good after good evening again. Uh, you have the year-to-date uh, monthly report. Um, last month, if you looked where we were comparative, you know, to the prior year, we were behind for you know quite a bit of money. That was because the property taxes were delayed by a day, or, you know, was was off by a day, and so they came in September. So you see that now that it is in you know comparable situation uh, on the revenue side. Um, we trail a little bit um, to where we thought we would be because, again, we will trail because of the revenue structure with that old keep fee uh, not being collected and, and registrations and, and so forth being down. Um, overall, we're in a, in a, in a decent position. Um, interest income is very low. Um, we'll watch that. We did budget for, uh, you know, expect a certain amount. so. Uh, that may be an area that we don't quite realize all of that revenue, um, but um, overall, um, our controlling of expenses uh, as much as we can is helping us get through, you know, with with the revenue shortfall. There are um, several things on the agenda for this uh, this evening. A uh, couple uh, pieces. Um, the district has a. Uh, tax deferred plan 403b and uh, plan we uh, the board needs to approve changes to that we've been asked by several uh, employees to add a plan a vendor to that plan 
that is a employee paid uh, con you know, system where they defer uh, taxes on that. Um, we've also been asked by some for adding a 457 model or plan to that. Um, both plans are um, creatively named after the section of the IRS code uh, that they come from, uh, the 403B and the 457. Um, both are tax shelters for nonprofit and governmental entities. Um, we have a third party, a TSA, that administers and manages the plans. And so those are the, you know, the agreements that we have there, and, and we do that. Um, you have also uh, two contract amendments for the two main transportation firms, for Student and Sunrise. Uh, for Student handles our home to school for uh, most of our students. Sunrise is our special ed uh, provider. Uh, we've been working on these for several months. Uh, the first student contract is in connection with uh, District 99 and Woodridge um, 68. Uh, the Sunrise contract is with 15 or 16 different districts altogether uh, with the same structure. One of the things after uh, the spring, uh, I think districts realized that we wanted to work in conjunction with each other so that you know, districts did not look differently one way or another. Some districts uh, settled for an 80% um, rate uh, structure. As the board recalls, it settled a contract uh, extension adjustment with first student uh, at 40%. Uh, we did that again with conjunction with our contract partners. Uh, and I think after that, then people started to kind of take notice. And so we wanted to be consistent. And, and we worked with everyone in the area um, to come up with those plans with the, with the transportation firms. The whole structure with those is to ensure uh, manage, manage risk and make sure that through this year, uh, as tumultuous as it, it may be, uh, that uh, we're able to have a, a steady transportation system ready to go um, when, you know, when we need them. Uh, and that has been one of the key pieces. Um, we also have a bid for snow removal. Um, that is, we, we contract every year for a portion of it. This is for an extended piece. Um, we hope and pray that we have a lesser year than last year. Um, it is a considerable difference uh, in cost, in the sense that um, you know that this, depending on what what snowfall comes, uh, this covers all properties, including sidewalks. Um, again, we, we're talking about managing risk, um, and we realize with the circumstances that we're in, custodians can't simply get up and leave their buildings for two hours from 10 o'clock till noon to shovel the, the sidewalks for several, in, you know, um, when we get a couple inches of snow. We have a transition time in that piece where we are going to have students leaving and coming at the elementary buildings, uh, which also means we need to have the rooms uh, sanitized and cleaned, uh, and we cannot have custodians out there. So uh, we are on a per push basis so that, you know, we're only paying when, when we need to as opposed to a a set amount um, and we have gone through and even though we have only one bidder on that contract on that bid uh, we did uh, review the rates with other contractors and um, they were in line with with what the industry in fact one contractor said that um, they could not have done uh, if they were able to bid it which they were not because the size um, their rates would have been higher than, than the, the bid that we received. So um, it is a considerable uh, piece, um, but again, you know, in managing the risk and making sure that we are uh, doing everything we can to ensure safety and security uh, of staff and students, um, we thought this is in the best interest of, of the district at this point in time. So with that, are there any questions? I had a question. Uh, one of the things that's an outlier on the expenditures as a percentage of budget is the capital fund. Um, about 80% of our budget for this year. Do you mind just speaking to that quickly? Uh, yes, and actually, thank you. Um, 
That is the remainder of, so we received the revenue, the, um, we did two playgrounds at, at uh, I should say, the district did the playgrounds raised by funds from the local community at Leicester and Henry Puffer. Um, and the way that we manage that structure is um, those um, communities and, and, and families had their own foundations and raised all that money. The district managed the plant project, awarded the bid, um, and approved and did all the work, and then we paid the vendor uh, because it's the district's property and we want to control, and, they are, and we had the architect go through all of that. Um, those projects finished in the summer, and so those final payouts happened uh, after July 1st. And so we had those final payouts now in just this last month or so, um, and that's the largest piece of, of the capital that is happening. We still have the El Sierra piece that could, you know, could happen that we're working through with the state, and we would have that revenue coming in. This revenue was actually received uh, in last fiscal year uh, because that's when the money was received by the district, but then the final payouts um, for those projects happened uh, after, you know, after the year began. Makes sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anything else? Thank, Thank you. you. All right, uh, the policy committee did not meet in September, but the legislative committee did. Uh, Member Doshi? Yeah, I'll uh, make this brief. Uh, there are two items on the agenda from the legislative committee. Uh, one is uh, Member Hannes will be our delegate at the upcoming delegate assembly, and so we discussed the um, resolutions that are, that are posed every year. Uh, this year there are 12 resolutions, po uh, position statements, or beliefs. Uh, just a quick background for those that are, are new to this process. Um, resolutions, uh, policy statements, or position statements and beliefs are really like a preview for what might be coming down the pike as, as legislation potentially from the state of Illinois or uh, Department of Education. Uh, but really, this is, not, this is not legislation currently. Uh, but it's a preview of things that are being lobbied for. And so what, uh, the way that our lobbying organization for us as school board members is the Illinois Association of School Boards uh, advocates on our behalf in Springfield uh, on a number of resolutions or position statements. And so what they do is they put these out around uh, September to give school boards an opportunity to deliberate on those position statements for about six weeks before there is a vote in November at what will typically be the I conference. And so that's where we are right now in the process. We are, we, they've released the resolution statements and uh, as a board, we would be discussing those. Now the way that we handle that as a school board is that we delegate that responsibility to discuss and propose positions uh, to the legislative committee. And so we started to dive into these resolutions at our last meeting, uh, just to understand a little bit of a lay of the land on what topics are coming up and I'll review those in a little bit uh, in, my, in my update. Uh, but the committee is gonna come back together next week to. Uh, ultimately discuss each of the positions and make a recommendation back to the board and we will have that on the, as a discussion item uh, at our monthly board meeting in November uh, to officially vote on those and um, then uh, Member Hannes will uh, take those to the Delegate Assembly on November 14th. So a little bit of a view of the timeline and the context. Um, on the uh, resolutions, there's a few that are I think particularly of interest that we will uh, surely report back on in November and we'll be discussing next week as a, as a committee. Uh, one is around uh, uh, loan programs for school districts. Um, a, a lot of these, by the way, are top of, top of mind for us as a district, and so let's re review those. Um, whether, the, whether school districts should be permitted to take a loan from the state, and uh, as you know, currently we, we can't do that. We cannot borrow money uh, from a state entity today, and uh, given the, uh, spike in expenses for many districts and the potential decline in revenues, uh, a lot of districts are facing shortages in their fund balance. And so there's a resolution potentially for advocating for a loan program that's offered to school districts. Um, there's some others around uh, teacher licensure uh, uh, in, in many ways to address the teacher shortage and to address uh, challenges that we see across the state and really across the country in terms of uh, student uh, reading levels and literacy levels. Uh, there are some resolutions that are being posed around how much local control should there be for school closures. Uh, as you all know, in uh, March and in April, uh, 
the governor exec, uh, provided an executive order to shut down schools across the state, uh, and uh, there is a resolution on whether that should have been uh, up to local control or not. Uh, and then there is a belief statement around uh, a position around diversity, equity, and inclusion that will that will be discussed as well. So a bit of a preview for what's coming down the pike in November, but um, uh, we'll be discussing that as a committee uh, next week. Uh, the other item that was on the agenda was what, what we often consider the uh, Legislative Committee Super Bowl of the year in February, which is the Legislative Breakfast. Uh, it's a unique thing that the District 58 Legislative Committee hosts. Uh, a lot of neighboring districts don't either have legislative committees or don't host such a breakfast, but it's a way for us to bring together our uh, congressional leaders and Senate leaders, um, uh, both, sorry, congressional leaders, both state and federal, in a way to have a discussion around topics that are top of mind in education or particularly to District 58. And we tend to invite a lot of our neighboring districts, school boards and uh, administrators uh, to join us for that. That'll be in February. Uh, this year we've made the choice to uh, plan for that to be virtual as opposed to in person, which would typically, typically have been at one of our high, uh, middle schools. Uh, and so uh, we are in the planning stages of how do you execute that virtually and what opportunities does that present us to change the format in some ways to still make it a uh, fulfilling experience for everyone. Uh, and so we're in the planning stages of that, uh, both coordinating with the legislators and also um, thinking about the format and structure of the, of the breakfast itself. That's the, uh, that's the update. We'll, we'll share more next month. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Disappointed it's going to be virtual this year, but I understand <laughs> why. It's always a fun time. Uh, the, the Financial Advisory Committee did not meet in September, neither did the district leadership team, but the Health and Wellness Committee did. Uh, Vice President Harris. Thank you. Uh, we met um, last Thursday via Zoom to discuss um, health and wellness in the district. Um, some interesting things that the board needs to be paying attention to, particularly um, in light of the fact that we are um, voting on rate increases for January 1st, later on uh, down the agenda. Um, the, um, for all intents and purposes, we have two plans in the district. We have the PPO plan, which um, has the, the lion's share of our, of our members, and then we have um, a, an HSA plan that was created during the last bout of collective bargaining. There are two other much smaller plans that have very little participation um, across our staff. Um, and they exist for nuanced reasons uh, of which one is you need to have a, a bronze plan that's in compliance with Obamacare. But as we're, as we're just, uh, for the, the general purposes of my, of my discussion, we're, I'm mainly focusing on the two big plans, the PPO and the HSA. Um, the, uh, the forecast for the end of uh, calendar year 2020 is that our PPO is going to have a surplus of about $1.5 million. Um, which is uh, which is 19.5 percent, and the HSA is going to have a surplus of 343,000, which is a much smaller number, but it's, uh, has many fewer members. So that's a surplus of, of 27.3 percent. Um, I don't know if, if you all recall um, where we were about a year ago, but uh, we were looking at deficits last year. So these are um, this is a, a huge uh, turn of events, um, driven by a couple of things. Um, you may re you may also remember that last year we had two premium increases. One came um, on July 1st, and then we wanted to align our, our premium changes with open enrollment, so we had a second um, rate increase on January 1st of, of this year, 2020, which we voted on last October. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, two, two, um, two rate increases in, uh, on the backs of each other um, certainly drives um, our surpluses. Also, we are in a much better place with our large claimants. We are, we are seeing um, data that our, our, um, our numbers are coming down there. And of course, it's been an unusual year with, um, with health overall. Um, the, the COVID pandemic is certainly affecting how people use their health care. And um, people are possibly putting off, um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, surgeries, uh, non-emergency surgeries. Um, they're, they're engaging in, in fewer activities, they're not driving, so we're seeing fewer ER visits, ER visits things like that. Uh, so we have ample surpluses, um, and that is um, driving the decision tonight that you're going to be voting on to, um, on our rate increases. You will see in, in uh, the recommendation from the administration that um, the HSA plan is, is 
um, recommended to have a premium decrease of 5%, and all the other three plans will have a, a, a 0% increase. Um, this is um, based on the recommendation from Group Alternatives, who is our, our third-party uh, consultant we work with as a committee. And th this is also, I would note, um, that Todd and I discussed this and we agree that they, they applied very conservative calculations. So this is, um, we feel pretty confident in those numbers. And um, the committee um, discussed this last week um, and at, at the previous health and meeting. There were some, there were some people who are not in support of this, but overall the committee signed off on the, the recommendation from group alternatives. And that's why we're seeing this recommendation to, tonight to have a 5% um, decrease for the HSA plan and keeping the others flat. Um, questions? No? Anything to add, Todd? Okay. Uh, question, Greg, just on like how we should be reading these numbers. Uh, is the goal to get as like on an annual basis to get the surplus deficit number as close as possible to zero, or are we looking at this at like as a three-year horizon of we'd like to be able to get to a place where we are never in the deficit? And we are always above, like at like you know five percent surplus or some some like sweet spot that makes sense and time horizon and then like volume. How do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, I I would I mean we've not had the conversation with in recent times with um, group alternatives uh, is our our uh, consultant our benefit consultant so. Everyone understands the district runs a essentially eight nine million dollar um, self insured fund. Uh, we have a benefit consultant that analyzes uh, the data, um, helps us go out and and review contracts and so forth. We hire Aetna as our third party administrator. Um, you really need an insurance company to work in that that format. Aetna, uh, United Light, United Health. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, whomever you have, uh, to access their markets and go forth and, and do that. Um, you know, we have not had a recent conversation of what's our our sweet spot um, per se long term. Um, one is we've been playing catch up for the last probably three years. Um, we're now in a position where the changes that the district has has gone through the committee, has recommended and the board, has accepted and, and moved uh, on the last 18 months with uh, changing uh, pr uh, prescription managers and making some of the adjustments and changes there, um, as well as some of the rates, as well as, you know, essentially a, a, a significant reduction in, in health care costs um, this last year have brought it to where we have a, a good strong position. Um, certainly we want to have 25% or so, 20-25% I would think, uh, fund balance draw, you know, at the end um, of each year so that we're managing uh, what's to come and having some balance to cover uh, and, and manage that. So, you know, that's, and, and to handle, we, the goal is that we have a structure so that we can manage the waves, right? So if you have a big wave, um, you don't have to spike rates. If you have a trough, you're not lowering them that down that much. You're wanting to keep it as level uh, over time as period. You know, that's kind of the goal with the fund balance with a self-insured plan uh, structure. Um, so with the recommendation, um, because it's because of those things, we're in such a good position that we can hold for the year with the three plan designs, the one plan, um, and then just as a reminder to the board, the conversation last year at this time about the HSA was uh, we, we, we let it increase along with all of the other at the same rate, uh, but did so um, with some smaller, I mean, it, it had smaller, um, it had a larger balance going, and um, because it had such a smaller group, we wanted to let it go another year, and and we had a large increase in, in participation at the last open enrollment. So now that we have what we would see a good statistical group of eighty people of eighty 
households in there uh, that gives us a, a sense as to what that plan is doing. So now we can say, you know, it's at 30, it, it's projected at a 37% uh, fund balance um, to, to expense, which that's, and that's with, I think, the 5% reduction. So that's a strong plan design and looking at the, what our projections are. Thanks for that. But, that. I don't know if that answered all of your question, but. It's, hel it's helpful just to get a sense for uh, stomaching the waves in either direction. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not seeing a 20% drop in premiums because we have 20% surplus. Right. We also wouldn't expect to have a 20% spike if we have a 20% deficit. So uh, that's, that's the, that's the advantage. I mean, there's a couple advantages to having a self-insured plan. That's one of them. The other is we, we avoid, there's a tax input, there's a tax piece to fully insured plans on that premium. So we avoid that piece as well. Um, and having some ability to manage those spikes. With a fully insured plan, uh, insurance companies, as part of the Affordable Care Act, they can only go up so much. And so, um, you know, you do have that way, the more of a wave action. So we're trying to, we're, we're working to get to that point. And we, you know, we think, you know, in the next couple of years, what we see is projection, we'll sh we should be able to hit that. Thanks. I ask kind of a dumb question about how this, how our insurance self insurance system works. I don't really understand this that well yet. Um, regardless of what plan you're a part of, all that all the the money kind of goes into the same like pot, so to speak, to pay out on claims. Is that correct? Or if you're in the HSA, like all the HSA money goes into this box on the counter, and when there's a claim from someone in the HSA, that's where it comes from. Or is all the money? combined and then they just paid it. I'm just trying to get right, a feel for like. Right, right. So, um, so the, all, of the, all of the money, we have a, a medical reserve fund, which is a segregated fund from the rest of the, the district's funds yeah. and resources. All of the claims get, you know, for any of those plan designs. Yeah. So we have one plan. They have different designs that we, that with our benefit consultants, yeah. say this is the rate, what we think the rate should be for this plan design, yeah. you know, because it's based on the benefits that that plan has. Sure. There is a, like all insurance, there's a certain level of overall coverage. Everything yeah. is contributing to the general good, right? When you're paying your, how, your, your car insurance, mm -hmm. there's a certain level that you're rated at because you're in your community, in Illinois, in the United States, mm -hmm. so forth. So, okay. there, there's that mentality of, of the of the whole fund as a whole, and then you look at the individual plan. So, yes, each plan design, if it you know runs out of money, it's not going. We don't stop paying it. It's all one fund. One fund. Okay. And in, and just and I just want to go one more, just so that we're in all transparency. If the fund was to run completely dry. The district, it's it's a self, you know, the district will have to pay the bill. You know, it is a asset of mm -hmm. the district, and it will have to, and a liability of the district. When you look at the audit, that money is rolled into the education fund or what's considered the corporate fund of the district, because it is it is wholly in there. We do that for transparency purposes, mm -hmm. but it is really truly, you know, just one piece of it. And Emily, just to, to piggyback off of that, what we also have is stopgap insurance. So if an individual had a claim, and I believe it's $150,000, Tom, right, is that correct? Yeah, right. um, then we purchased additional insurance to protect the liability of the district, so then the insurance company would pick that up if it's above $150,000. Mm -hmm. so, so there is protection from um, a, a, a giant bill, so to speak, if we were to find ourselves in that. Mm -hmm. Right, because if yeah, we have had $2 million, I mean, people, you know, a million dollar claim, Mm -hmm. uh, over a course of a year or a year mm -hmm. and a half, mm -hmm. and sure. you know, so we cap it. We buy additional insurance coverage to to minimize again that risk and that liability. Yeah, I was just trying to envision like sure. if we're mm -hmm. um, talking about like riding the like these these waves of having one year where claims are really high and you know we're kind of thinking, oh my gosh, we're not going to be able to like our, our funds are running very low, and then this year where our, our we're, it's looking like it's really great, and that's one year to the next, and so riding these waves and. Um, Kind of just trying to envision is our is there any sense to saying um, try to try to continue to build that fund so that we can ride the wave into the next year and and thinking of it more as like this one fund and we're all contributing and whether yeah I'm in the HSA and, and we have a good fund balance and that, that plan is doing so well but 
we're going to continue to try to build that balance, and so we're going to keep all rights. I'm, I'm just trying to get the right. big picture of how that works. So that there's also my there's also a certain piece of that a um, because employees do pay a portion. Some uh -huh. so, and some employee groups pay a larger portion. Sure. Uh, and you know, and so we want to be cognizant of there is a cost in a structure. And, you know, um, with the HSA, you know, uh, there's a contribution. That the district makes into that health savings account for those individuals that are in that fund, mm -hmm. but they are then ultimately responsible for the first fifteen hundred, three thousand right. dollars of all of the bills mm -hmm. that they're paying on that high deductible plan. Mm -hmm. That's a different benefit and a different uh, structure than the PPO, the universal PPO that doesn't have that. Doesn't have that. Um, and so that means that the rates are different because of the different benefits. Mm -hmm. And so we want to also be true to each of those plan designs has to in some way, you know, represent that light, you know, that piece that people are paying a portion of whether, sure. you know, the district's paying 85% or the district paying 60%, 40%. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. We have no discussion items tonight, so that'll take us on to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Criticism of individuals is not in order. The board has allotted 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We ask that you keep your comments to a three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. At this time, I have received one card. Um, we ask that you would step up, to the, uh, step up to the podium, state your name in your attendance area, and then provide your public comment. Allison Brechtel from Herrick Middle School. My name is Allison Brachtel. I'm a teacher at Herrick. Um, board, I am concerned about the health of our staff, especially with students returning to the school buildings next week. Um, the district is requiring misters, a machine that sprays the surfaces and walls of the classrooms, be used every night to protect against coronavirus. It contains chemicals that district officials admit isn't the safest for students and staff. This chemical is so toxic that staff members are encouraged to leave the buildings during the sanitation process. It is also so toxic that it has 29 warning labels, including California Proposition 65, New York Air Toxics, and EPA Priority Chemicals List, which discloses cancerous ingredients. According to the Environmental Working Group, this cleaning product called Triple S Renegade contains chemicals linked to severe health concerns including cancer, asthma, developmental, and reproductive toxicity. However, because this product is verified by the EPA, our district is saying that it's good enough despite all health concerns. Plus, district officials also said they already spent the money on acquiring these misters, and the currently used chemical is also affordable and convenient. I don't think this logic is good enough, especially when it comes to student and staff safety. There are other affordable options out there, including UV lights currently used by neighboring districts, and safer chemicals, such as Clorox commercial biostain and odor, also verified by the EPA. Students and staff shouldn't have to fear for their health by coming to school, especially during a pandemic. I'm asking that the district reevaluate their priorities and purchase a cleaning so solution that is both effective and safe for staff and students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Russell, my understanding is you just did some kind of analysis where you, I don't know, you worked with an outside company on this as well. I remember see, receiving an email on there. I don't know. Uh, that was just a lot for me, so I don't know if there's any clarification you can give on that. Sure. Uh, and I'll turn it over to uh, Kevin Bardo, our, our Director of Buildings and Grounds. One of the things that I want to assure our community is that whenever a health concern is made, um, we always contract with a third party to take a look at it and to make sure that we're not doing anything that's harmful to our staff. I, I also would like to clarify, um, the district administration would never ever say it's good enough and then risk the health of our, our, our students and staff. I want to make that point clear. 
Um, so Kevin, if you, if you want to talk about um, the third party analysis. Oh, <coughs> excuse me, sure. We, the district uh, retained our uh, environmental consultants, industrial hygienists, to do a uh, uh, inspection of the chemical and the review of the hazard. Um, actually just sat through a, a EPA webinar within the last week. Um, and basically uh, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rhododenticide Act authorizes the EPA to regulate any pesticide product sold and distributed in the United States. And before any pesticide product can be lawfully sold or distributed, the EPA has to perform a comprehensive scientific assessment of this product. Uh, the, the agency evaluates the active ingredients, other ingredients in the product, and the proposed use patterns to ensure that when the product is used according to label directions, no adverse effects on human health or the environment will occur. And that is consistent with um, the webinar that I participated in with what our consultants um, uh, reported um, as uh, this concern was brought to us. Thank you. Um, do we have any recordings? We have one. Okay. At this time, we'll go ahead and play any public comments that have been submitted. It sounds like we have one. So if you want to go ahead and play that for us. Hi, this is Melissa Rapp, students at Whittier and Herrick. I'm sorry I can't be there this evening with you as much as I would love to be. Um, I apologize not to be in person, but thank you for taking my call. I am calling this evening uh, because the last few weeks have left me frustrated at this process as a parent and an educator. I recognize that this is uncharted territory and that this summer the work that was put in was disrupted by IDP's guidelines and that this year calls for everyone to be able to pivot when necessary. However, these are not justifications for a rushed plan. A couple of weeks ago, families were hounded by reminders from the district about completing learning designation process, even though the district had yet to release the FAQ document. On Tuesday, my children were told that the trimester was ending early. They were told they would need to get in any missing work they could during this three-day week, and that was it for the, the trimester. The district seemingly made an abrupt decision to shorten the trimester with no clear communication to families or to students about why the decision was made or how this will impact the rest of the year. This evening, my seventh grade son sits wondering what is going to happen with his schedule next week and if tomorrow is the last day, he will be with his teachers because the district determined that the timeline for informing families of teacher placement would occur after the last day with teachers. Each of these are missteps in the process and could have been avoided had the district taken a moment and slowed down the process. Since the spring, Dr. Russell has taken the position that in-person learning is superior to remote learning and has taken an aggressive approach to get students back into the building. However, Dr. Russell himself has said that this process takes time and that there are only so many hours in a day and the team has had to work tirelessly to achieve this plan. I agree. It takes copious amount of time and key pieces are not being met because the time and attention is not being given to the process. I recognize we are in this. I recognize that the people in our district are working tirelessly, but the strategy to push hard to meet these timelines is not best practice. I beg you to slow down, to reflect, regenerate, refocus, and take your time so that obvious missteps like the ones that have happened the past few weeks do not have as much opportunity to occur. I thank you all for the time that you are spending on this. Our children are in good hands. I just hope that those hands slow down a bit and give the time that is needed to iron out the rest of the year. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. All right, no more, right? Okay. Is there any other additional comments uh, we have from the room today? Let me down. <laughs> All right. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to our approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right. If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of September 14th, 2020 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, any discussion? 
Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the minutes of the September 14th, 2020 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the September 28th, 2020 special meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the September 28th, 2020 special meeting as presented. Uh, next up is our consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consist consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of a list of bills and the summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. We do not have a recommendation for action tonight for the return to learn plan for 2021. So next up, we have the recommendation to approve medical insurance rates. Is there a motion to approve the changes to the medical insurance rates as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the changes to the medical insurance rates as presented. Next up is the amendment to the district sponsored 403B plan to include a 457 plan. Is there a motion to approve the changes to the employer sponsored employee self funded retirement system by adding a 457 plan and adding plan member services as a vendor to the 403B plan? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve changes to the employee employer sponsored employee self funded retirement system by adding a 457 plan and adding a plan member services as vendor to the 403B plan. We have an amendment to the first student transportation contract. Is there a motion to approve the amendment to the 2020 through 2021 contract with first student as presented? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the amendment to the 2020 through 2021 contract with first student as presented. We also have an amendment to the Sunrise Transportation contract. Is there a motion to approve the amendment to the 2020 through 2021 contract with Sunrise Transportation for special education transportation as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the amendment to the 2020 through 2021 contract with Sunrise Transportation for the special education transportation as presented. We have a Pierce Downer School Roofing Design and Engineering Consulting Services. Is there a motion to approve and accept to accept the Roof Design and Engineering Consulting <coughs> Services with Inspect Inc. at a fee of 6.25% of the lowest responsible construction bid? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I just I actually thought this would get more discussion before. Um, I think when we first talked about this a few months ago it was 900,000 now it's 1.3 to 1.5 and then we're adding 6% on top of that so another let's call it 80,000 mm -hmm. and you know we've got a lot of a lot of words on paper I guess I still don't appreciate what that 900 to 1.5 gets us you know and we spent a lot of time talk, talking about iPads when we spent 30 grand 
but when we talk about 1.5 million, it's yeah. you know it's a roof, right? It's not sexy, but I think as a board member, I'd like to appreciate what exactly goes into that 1.5 million. So I'm going to let Kevin and Todd take this one, as they've been working with uh, our consultants on this. Sure. Thanks for your questions. Um, the initial cost estimate was something that uh, initially was developed last year with a, a different consultant um, that I was working on. Um, the increase, the cost increase is mostly in the unknowns of what extent masonry repair would happen along with the roof because it would need to occur at the same time. Uh, for instance, um, lightning protection system. We have to evaluate what is currently there and what has to go back. Um, also, the, uh, an area like uh, HVAC penetrations for ductwork. If there's an existing curbing from uh, uh, an area that's no longer used, um, we would take that out. Uh, if there's um, additions that need to go in, such as uh, that building does not have a, a roof access ladder for the custodian. So that's something that we would add. Um, so the, the cost increase from the 900 to you know 1.1 or even up to 1.5, Steve, is basically some of those unknowns that as we work through the construction drawings, we'll be able to pin that down a little harder. Right now, it's just a general ballpark cost opinion. And then as you go through the design documents, you start getting a little tighter and then once you bid it out, you'll have your final numbers at that point. Okay. No, th thanks for answering that. It kind of gives me a little bit more appreciation. I guess one thing that I would ask, uh, just to kind of make me feel more comfortable the next time this gets presented, is if we can maybe have some, some photos and some diagrams to supplement the, the well-written memos. So I would appreciate okay. that. Sounds and, good. Uh, we can, um, to that point, um, we can certainly still provide those in, in our weekly updates to the board. Um, so we'll make sure that we get those for you. Thank you. Thanks. I also feel like in, in general, just to kind of go back as well, this is a, an opportunity for us to go out to bid. I feel like a lot of times we see a lot more detail in justifying the, uh, the work that's being done when we receive the, the final bid in the past. But I, I think it's a fine point to add that in the bidding process, understanding what we're going out to bid yeah, for. Yeah, this is a potential well. $93,000 expenditure for Absolutely. our district. No. So I, I think that's a sizable. It's, I think it's a fantastic idea. I just got a question about INSPEC. Um, mm -hmm. I imagine that INSPEC is, is doing these services to provide consulting. Is it possible that they also then end up bidding on the project? Or are they not in that business? No, they're strictly design engineers, so they would not be able to bid on the project. The, the advantage of going with the design engineer is that when you go to bid, um, they this is what they do. And so you're, you're hedging that so you, you don't get gouged in the bid process or something like that down the line. Um, another common question is why don't we use white for something like this, you know, if they're our architect? And, and the reason for that is white has a lot of expertise, but when it comes to roofing and, and all the intricacies involved in a roofing project, you really want to go with a roofing expert. And so that's what this firm can offer that, although white is a very comprehensive firm, uh, and they're very good at what they do. Uh, this is specifically for a roofing um, bid spec and all of that, and that's why we want to go with them. Another ask, maybe as this uh, as this goes through the process, in the last 19 years, we've done 14 other roofs, mm -hmm. and just like having a ballpark estimate or actual like what the cost was of historical expenditures on roofs, yeah, would be helpful for us to. I don't think any of us have approved a roof, at least I haven't approved a roof expense before, and so mm -hmm. it would be helpful to understand what, how that falls in the range of what we, what we paid in the past. So just knowing, that, knowing that inflation is going to cause costs to rise over the course of two decades. Sure. And, and um, so just to clarify what, what the board's asking for moving forward, um, pictures uh, of the roof, um, and then um, as far back as we can find uh, roofing costs by year, by building. Um, to kind of get an estimate. Nice square footage. Mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, we would provide the square footage with that, obviously, because you know the the roof at Herrick is going to be a little different than the roof at um, Pierce Tower. Yeah. Is six point two five percent a pretty standard consulting fee for this type of work? That's, that's average. In some yeah, I, I, I think it's in line with what we would see. I'll, I'll defer to Todd if, if, if he would think that would be abnormal. Um, I, we wouldn't have made the recommendation if we would have thought that was abnormal, but I, I think you're right in the spot, Kevin. Yeah, it's actually. Uh, Inspects rate is, is very competitive and, and very um, beneficial to the district. Um, 
a lot of competitors, you're, you're going to see more in the 8% or uh, above 9 for the uh, dollar amount of this project. So that is a substantial, even though um, it, it could be, uh, like uh, someone mentioned, you know, upwards of uh, 80 or 90K, um, it, on, the, on the bright side, I suppose, is um, it could be much more than that using a competitor. Discussion or questions? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner? Aye. Member Joshi? Aye. Member Hannes? Aye. Member Harris? Aye. Member Olchik? Aye. Member Samanti? Aye. Member Hughes? Aye. The motion carried to accept a roof design and engineering consulting services with Inspect Inc. at a fee of 6.25% of the lowest responsible construction bid. We have a bid for snow removal. Is there a motion to award the snow removal bid to al alternates number one and three to Tim's Snow Plowing Inc. doing business as the Surface Innovator, the Service Innovators TSI? So, so second. Any discussion here? Why? Why? Why was there only one bid that ended up uh, coming through here? <laughs> um, why is there only one bid? Uh, you know, we think it's attributed to several factors. Uh, one, with the district our size, it is a pretty significant add to a contractor. Um, and, and, and it is a little, no, I wouldn't say late in the year, but, you know, we would like to see this more towards the end of uh, July and August. Um, you know, maybe moving forward we can do something like that. Um, we, we did check, uh, as Todd mentioned before, uh, we've um, utilized a contractor in the past for several properties. So we were able to compare those historical rates to the current rates for plowing. Uh, and then sidewalk work, we did have to do a little more investigation with the uh, vendors that attended the optional pre-bid meeting to determine if you know, these rates that we received were within uh, expected market rates. And, and what we found is, even though we have a significant amount of linear feet of sidewalk in the district, um, the price that two of the people that attended the pre-bid would have actually been higher. Okay. All right. Any other discussion or questions? Okay. Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the snow removal bid with alternates number one and three to Tim Snow Plowing Inc. doing business as the Service Innovators TSI. We have surplus equipment, uh, a bandsaw and a tractor. Is there a motion to designate a bandsaw and a John Deere 525 tractor as surplus equipment? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to designate a bandsaw and a John Deere 525 tractor as surplus equipment. Last up, we have the adoption of policies 2220, 2220-E9, 510, 5100, 5220, 5330, 710, 7180, 7185, 7340, and 7345. Is there a motion to adopt policies 2220, 2220-E9, 510, 5100, 5220, 5330, 710, 7180, 7185, 7340, and 7345 as presented? So moved. Second. Is there, any dis is there any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt policies 2, 220, 2, 220-E9, 510, 5, 100, 5, 220. 5330, 710, 7180, 7185, 7340, and 7345 as presented. We do have a couple of announcements, uh, all dates to, 
to keep in mind. Uh, one is Tuesday, October 20th at 7 a.m. will be the next policy committee uh, meeting at the ASC and over Zoom. Wednesday, October 21st at 3.45 p.m. will be the next legislative committee at the ASC and over Zoom. And Monday, October 26th at 7 p.m. will be the curriculum workshop right here at Village Hall. Sorry, that's not at Village Hall. It's at Indian Trail. All right. At Indian Trail. Thank you. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district? 5 ILCS 122 C1. The placement of individual students in special education programs and other matters relating to individual students. 5 ILCS 122 C10. And the discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purpose of approval by the body of the minutes or the semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by section 2.06 5 ILCS 122 C21. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Simonski. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. Let's meet in the other room at 9:20. All right, the board has now returned to open session here at 9.41 p.m. Thanks for being friends. Um, we do have a couple of action items from closed session. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the September 14th, 2020 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to the confidential nature of the contents? So moved. Second. Melissa, please call roll. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Simanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the September 28th, 2020 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to the confidential nature of the contents? So moved. Second. Melissa, please call roll. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. I'm all right, and we've come to the end. So is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Move. Second. <laughs> right, is there any discussion? All, 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 all right, <laughs> Melissa, please call roll. <laughs> Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The meeting is now adjourned at 942.